Well, I go through a transition every time I walk up here because I'm the guy who typically people see as the quiet guy in the corner, and then I come up and stand up here and I do all the talking, so it's definitely a transition for both me and you. But we all go through transitions, and when they occur, we often ask, now what? Well, I'll tell you this. Don't wait for a sign from heaven. Start by doing what's obvious. And when you do, God is going to follow through. Some years ago, I took my son on a hunting trip, just up north. It was a day trip. Wanted to show him how to really be a man in the wilderness and navigate by a compass and map. Boy, did that go wrong. <laughs> we drove up into the middle of nowhere, got out of the car, had all of our gear on and a compass and a map. The plan was to head north to the highway. Then we would parallel that for a little ways, head back south to the road we were on, and then back over to the car. Pretty basic navigation. You wouldn't think much would go wrong. So we set out into the woods. Had a great time. We were hunting squirrels. Now before anybody gets upset, no animals were harmed in the creation of this sermon. Anyone who has hunted with me knows that I can't hit a pink elephant at 20 yards. Even the animals are not afraid of me. So we made our way toward the north, found a number of squirrels, and the fun thing with squirrels is they like to go to the opposite side of the tree, so then you have to go around the other side and chase them back and forth. So they're, even if you don't uh, actually bag any game, it's a fun, uh, fun sport. So we, we made it to, yeah, not for them, they probably still don't like it. We made it to the highway, paralleled the highway for about 15, 20 minutes, turned back south. Now we're just going to head back to that road and find our car. And again, we are circling around these trees as we are encounter different squirrels numerous times. And every time I look at the compass and realize, okay, we got to get back on track because we're heading south. We find another squirrel, circle around another tree, and... Oh yeah, we got to go south. After three or four squirrels and trees, I realized, hmm, oh boy, compass is broke. It's not moving at all. How many trees have we circled around and gone readjusted to the south or to the south or to the south? Now I have no idea where we are and I'm kind of panicking. So... I try to let logic think in and, or sink in, and I'm also praying for God to give me a sign because I'm not real good at getting lost and being found again. So I thought, well, the first thing you do is you look for a distant landmark, and then you head to it, or at least you keep it in the same perspective, and eventually you hit a road. But we're in all these tall trees. There are no landmarks. So now what? Then I thought, well, okay, the obvious thing in Boy Scouts is moss grows on the north side of a tree. So whoever came up with that cruel joke, <laughs> moss grows on all sides of the tree. Now what? So then I really prayed hard for a sign. Waited a little bit. And this is a true story, by the way, even though it's a little bit embellished. A flock of little birds came flying through the brush that we hadn't seen before, and I thought, is this the sign? Okay, Justin, we're going to follow these birds. So we followed the birds for a while. Uh, then we noticed the flock came through going the other way. So, well, maybe we got disoriented and God's correcting. So we followed the birds again this way. And sure enough, the birds came this way again, but then another flock came this way. And I realized, okay, uh, following the sign isn't working. Now I'm to the last resort. And I remember what every good cowboy used to do in the movies. When they were lost in the desert, they would fire into the sky three times, and help would come. So I shot three times into the sky, and we just waited. Uncomfortably long time. I thought, well, maybe they're on their way. They just need some redirection. So I, I shot three more times into the sky and waited a painfully long time. And Justin says, Dad, maybe you should fire into the sky again. I said, son, I would love to, but I'm all out of arrows. 
now what? So we just sat there and prayed again for a sign. And then Justin says, hey, Dad, there's a sign. Yes, son, I'm praying for a sign. Pray- no, Dad, there's a sign. Dad, there's a sign right over there. And I kid you not, there was a sign on a wooden post, a big brown sign that said Manistee National Recreation Area. Big red X, you are here, follow the trail, and in five minutes we were back to our car. What a relief. Sometimes we pray for a sign from heaven when the obvious is right before us. Now this is going to be You know, this is not a dead church. By the time worship service or the praise and worship team is done, we're all pretty well awake. But in case you still aren't, this is going to help keep you awake, I certainly hope. Audience participation. When I go through the now what's, when I say, when I do this, I want everybody to say, now what? So let's practice. Now what? Now what? Now what? Hope you online are listening because I can't hear you. So, if we live long enough, we will get to the time when our kids are moved out. Now, what? Or you discover that you're single again. Now, what? One morning you wake up and your hair is gray and you got an AARP card in your hand (laughs) and you're a senior citizen. Or maybe you've not lived all that long and you're still working and your hair might be prematurely gray, but something has really changed in your life. Now, what? Well, let's review some of these scenarios and see what the Bible has for insight on all these now what questions. The first one is the empty nester. The kids have moved out. Proverbs 22.6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And I paraphrase the end of that to say, otherwise, when he is old, he will not leave his bedroom. That was me. Sometimes our kids need a little bit of a boost to move on. I certainly did. It was when I found the girl of my dreams, biggest eyes, most beautiful smile ever, and she was looking at me, believe it or not. I thought, ooh, time for me to leave, just like the kung fu guy. Snatch the pebble out of your hand. Now, at first, you may find this an enjoyable bonus amount of extra time and peace and sanity. Beware it may be the calm before the storm. Because you will find yourself busier than ever, perhaps giving advice and counseling to those who have left. Financial support, we are all hopefully prepared for that. Important decisions will need to be made, and you're going to have to help them with that. Moving, you're going to have to help them move, maybe several times. Renovate their new home that they buy, or their old home that they buy. And then there's babysitting, or grand babysitting. But eventually, these things may wind down like an old grandfather clock, and the tick-tock, tick-tock of monotony will kick in. And that's when you say, now what? Unlike birds who push their fledglings out of the nest, humans never make that separation. And you may find that your empty nest is never completely empty. But don't wait for a sign from heaven. Do what's obvious. The first thing is to pray for them and for yourself. Our children will face challenges, struggles, failures. And we will need wisdom, not just the quick fix it. Sometimes logic kicks in and we can fix it, but sometimes it's more complicated. And we need to lean on God for that. And specifically, we can do our best to guide our kids to the finish line, but we can't take them across. Pastor Ben talked last week, yes, I did listen, about transitions with our kids, perhaps difficulties, the enemy comes in, and then we have to let God finish that work. Salvation is by grace, not by works, and that includes your works to help save your kids. Three, provide a refuge for them, because they will return home from time to time, and they will still need your love and advice. And they will fail occasionally. Just like the prodigal son, he received him back without 
judgment. And this is the one I think is the most important to get across. Sometimes they just need you with no advice. This might be the hardest one to do. <laughs> or you could double clutch. Now that's not the term for trucking in the motor. That's a term for birds. Birds double clutch. Often mallard ducks, I see them out in the river. They lay a clutch of eggs. They hatch. They swim away, get big. They're gone. They do that a second time. They raise a second family that season. Now, I notice nobody's throwing anything at me yet, so thank you for that. But I'm not saying to start a whole family again. But you could host an exchange student, and you could train up that child in the way they should go. You could provide housing for a missionary. You could take in a college student. We did that as a great experience. And again, you can train up a child in the way they should go. And in this case, if it doesn't work, <laughs> you can always send them back. <laughs> now, what about if I'm single again? Perhaps you're divorced, possibly you're widowed. Maybe you had a business and it's split. Or maybe you're just like me just found that girls were never as exciting as catching frogs. Doug, we talked about that. You just move on. 1 Corinthians 7. I wish that all men were as I am, single. That's my word put in there. And this is Paul talking. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn in passion. So Paul is saying from his own experience, it's actually better to be single if you can manage that. So perhaps you've been married or you had a close friend, a platonic relationship, or even a business partner because of death, divorce, Division, you're now alone in your life or in your work. And you find yourself asking, what now? <laughs> See? See, I was just doing that to check if they're listening. <laughs> now what? That's good. <laughs> Pastor Rachel's message last uh, few weeks ago about singleness was excellent. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not the one who should be speaking about singleness because I'm not. I was a long time ago, but I don't want to claim that I have all the advice. I certainly don't. But I can lean on what the Bible points out here. But one of the things she said, singleness is not a problem to be fixed. It might be a problem if you make it that way or you think that it is, but not because somebody told you that it is. In fact, it may actually be a gift if you look at it that way. You may have the opportunity to, to now do what you could not do before. Perhaps live in peace. No disagreements, no snoring. If you find yourself talking too much, just stop. Can't decide which choice, what restaurant to go. I want to go to this one or I want to go to that one. Well, just pick one. <laughs> you win either way. But don't wait for a sign from heaven. Begin by doing what's obvious first thing you do is pray. And you're going to notice there's a pattern here. Number one is always pray. You pray about it because God knows your need. And he knows what's best for you. And that may be the hardest one for us to accept. In all situations, actually, Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. To those who love him and are called to his purpose. It's sometimes difficult. Oftentimes when we look back, we see that, yeah, that was right. But when you're going through it, it's difficult. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Right. Don't even have to wait. He will direct your path. So two, prepare for the, a barrage of self-help gurus, dear Abbies, tireless interrogators because they will fix your problems. Hey, even though you don't think you have a problem, and I hope you don't, they're going to fix it even though it does not exist. Years ago, this is not exactly 
the same scenario, but years ago, I spent an entire year sugar-free. I stopped eating all processed sugar, white bread, white rice, all those things. Best healthy year of my life. But I finally had to give up, and I gave in to peer pressure. People could not understand why I had given up sugar. They all thought, are you diabetic? You have high blood pressure, or you have a heart problem, you got a weight problem. Well, yeah, but that wasn't it. All these things, they were trying to figure out what my problem was and fix it, and they were always uncomfortable with me. Finally, I gave up and I started eating sugar again. I wish I had not given I'm giving you advice. Don't give in to peer pressure. In fact, number three is to find wholesome friends. Those who will accept you as single until you decide that you want to pursue a partner again, if that ever happens. Proverbs 18, 24, a man or a woman of many companions may come to ruin. Because if you react and think, well, I can't be alone, everyone tells me I'm going to find all kinds of friends, well, you're going to find out many of those friends you choose quickly will perhaps lead you astray. Choose your friends wisely. 1 Corinthians 15, be not deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. That is a standalone verse. Get that in your mind and keep it there. Forgive, number four, forgive as appropriate because death may cause bitterness toward God. Separation or divorce could cause unforgiveness to a former spouse. A broken business partnership can create an unwanted competition and again, bitterness and strife. Forgiveness may be easier said than done. I think we all know that because we can easily say, okay, I forgive you, and then you walk away with all you can think of is that issue. And then you put on the fake smile when you come back. Hi, hey, you're forgiven. But it's really not for us to forgive because it's just, it's, it's just like salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith, not by works. It's a work of sanctification, a partnership between us and the Lord. So it is with forgiveness. We give it to God, and then God works that out in our life, and it may take time for us to be fully forgiving of those issues. <laughs> Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. Be faithful to God in your singleness. He will promote you when the time is right. The key is to be faithful. Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. I go to the story of Joseph in prison. He was faithful to God and all of that. And God promoted him to the ruler of all Egypt. Daniel in captivity. He was faithful to God. He became the cupbearer to the king. So let's move to the wonder years. Those years where I wonder where I left my car keys. <laughs> wonder where I parked. You do this. Wonder where I left my glasses. <laughs> oh, I wonder what day it is. You know, there are three signs of old age. And I think we all, we all know the first sign. You start to lose your memory. Then the second sign. I knew it in the first service. This is the first service. All right, just move on. It'll come to me. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4.16. So we do not lose heart. This is good. Paul really comes and hits you over the head with a hammer, and then he softens the blow by making you feel good. He says this, so that we do not lose heart. <laughs> Thanks for that. Though our outer self is wasting away, inner self is being renewed day by day. For those of us who are over a certain age, yes. If it seems like some things are wasting away, more things are not working now. But inside, I can attest that I am being renewed. I look awful on the outside, but on the inside, I look way better than I did years ago. You've lived a long life. 
Your career is behind you. Maybe you sold your business. Friends have come and gone. Perhaps you've outlived some of your siblings or your family members and best friends. You've downsized to a condominium. People just don't visit as much as they used to. The only time you get out of the house is for a doctor's visit or to go to church. And you feel your life has become a burden. And you find yourself asking, now what? Well, don't wait for a sign from heaven. Begin by doing the obvious. First, you pray. But this time it may not be so much praying about yourself. Pray for others. Make it your new career. Years ago, my friend George Way, he died at the age of 92. Awesome member of our family. We took him to church Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings back then, Sunday nights occasionally too. In his 80s, George had already outlived almost all of his friends and family. He moved from Detroit over to this side of the state and he began attending in our church and we were assigned and it was a privilege to take him to church. George said, when I came over here I had nothing left in my life and I began to wonder, what is in it for me now, Lord? What do you have for me to do? And he said the elders came over and talked to him. He said, George, if nothing left, you can still pray. Now that may seem trivial, but I came over to George's house a number of times, and he showed me this spiral notebook with 300 names in it, and he showed me, here's yours and your family, and I pray for you. And every name in this spiral book, every day, and I will tell you, when George passed away, I can document a few years in our family's life where we struggled. Not bad struggles, but they were noticeable. Then I began to think, before that, when my mother passed away, we also had the same struggle. My mother was a great prayer warrior in my life. And before that, my Aunt Helen, who was another great prayer warrior, when she passed away, there was a few years of struggles. Never underestimate the power of your prayers. And if you could make a career out of that, imagine the impact. So know this, your identity or your, well, your purpose does not end with your career. Many people find their validation in their work or their job or their business and now it's no longer there and that validation no longer comes. Your identity has never come from what you did but the master that you served, and that master still values you more than ever. So get up early every morning, follow a schedule, and continue to work, but this time your job is solely for the master. And even if you follow your passions, or you volunteer, or you do something worthy, tangible, you do it fully as unto the Lord. Do unto others as you wished, they had done unto you. You have that opportunity now. Titus 2 says this. Older people are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. The writer here is not speaking about feeble souls wasting away. Perhaps the bodies are, but the souls are not. So if you cannot do, then teach. There's that old saying that those who can't do teach, and it actually works. Well, now if you're absolutely unable to do the things you used to do, teach someone else. My dad, in his 80s, wrote a book about his life and our family's life, and it became a leg it's going to become a legacy. He wrote another book after that. He preserved the past, and he is sending it forward. You could do the same. You don't have to be a an accomplished writer, write things down. Maybe someone else can help you formulate that. George Way, my old friend, always talked about writing a book, but he never made it. He never got to actually writing the book. His title was going to be The Questions They Never Asked Me. 
think about that. Are there questions you want to answer that no one asks? Write a book. And then the Bible honors age. Not that age by itself is an achievement to be honored, but along with age comes wisdom. And wisdom being the wholesome and righteous application of knowledge to lead others is honorable. Wisdom is honorable. So in Hebrews 13, 7, remember your leaders and be that leader. Those who spoke to you the word of God, now you be the one who speaks that word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Be the one of wisdom and honor that others will aspire to be. But what if you've not lived all that long? You're still working. You have a good job. All is well. Things are going your way. Or maybe not. And perhaps your hair is only prematurely gray. But the greatest transition of your life has just happened. You got saved. You've been born again. You have seen the light. And it's not a train at the end of the tunnel. And you find yourself asking, now what? Well, this time, don't waste time with the obvious because you just got a sign. Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. 2 Peter 3 says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is in the midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt you with loud singing. And Romans 8.37, Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for. I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God who is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Worship team, if you would come. If you find yourself, you've been born again. You're a believer. You're in the house of the family of God. And what do you do now? What do you suppose step one is? Pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for You know, some of us, we get saved and everything is great. We move on in life and it's the best thing ever. Others get saved and the next day is just another day. And a few of us get saved.
Second point after you're saved, get baptized. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I can speak to you from experience that making that commitment, sometimes it's difficult to just go into that water and come out because the enemy doesn't want you to. We're not saved by baptism, but I will tell you, will you follow that? Because Jesus himself did, and he said for us to do it. When you follow that, you will find something happens in your life. Three, develop relationships with godly, moral, ethical people. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, bad company good character. I've heard it said, and I think it's true from my observations, it's been said that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If you observe certain people, you can't, maybe maybe not all the, all the time, but sometimes certain people are just hard not to observe. And if you see the friends that they hang around with, you'll see there's commonality there. Choose your friends wisely. Choose God-honoring people to spend your time with. It will ensure that you will do the same. Four, live a life that is honoring to God. Deuteronomy 6.5 You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, with all your might. If you follow that, you can hardly go wrong. But what if, what if you are listening to me right now, in this room, or out there at home, and you say, well, none of this to me. I'm not born again. I'm not a believer. I might be curious about that. I'm looking into it. But I really don't believe. And maybe you're still under the burden of sin. Maybe you're still concerned about what happens if you were to pass away. time with the obvious. Because that obvious has been in front of you all along. Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made all creation. Everything that we see in our world cries out that there is a creator in such a way that no man, woman, person, you, I, have no excuse not to believe. So don't waste your time now is the time 